appreciate the opportunity to come here. I'm, I'm looking forward to be able to listen to this presentation just as well as, uh, as I know many of you are. I know uh, in my field, I, I, as a legislator, I work in many different areas, but in uh, the primary areas that I want to focus in are in tax reform, which is a big part of what we're doing down there, but the other part is working with uh, the other legislators in occupational licensing. It's, I, I think it's a Two, two legs of the three-legged stool that provide for economic development in there. But I wanted to take just a, this opportunity to uh, uh, introduce uh, today's uh, speaker. I'm going to use, since he has such a long, I want to make sure I use my notes so I don't miss anything uh, in doing this. Uh, Dr. Dick Carpenter is the Director of Strategic Research for the Institute of Justice, which is a nonprofit uh, public interest law firm and a professor at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. Uh, he is a national expert on occupational licensing, and over the years he has had many successful and unsuccessful, I understand that, uh, by state governors and legislators to reform <coughs> occupational licensing. Uh, he has been here, or he's here today to offer insight into our current challenges and what reforms we could uh, help our Kansans, uh, which we could use quite a bit of help on. The, uh, uh, Dr. Carpenter is the author of the book, Bottleneckers, Gaming the Government for Power and Private Profit. In his book, he explains how special interest groups create and, in, and increase regulations that benefit themselves. By restricting entry through regulations like occupational licensing, they increase their economic advantage uh, without creating additional value for consumers. Uh, Dr. Carpenter says, conservatives refer to the special interest group as crony capitalists, uh, while, liberal, while the liberals uh, label them as fat cats. I can see both sides on that issue. So, uh, uh, he said that the name that best <coughs> describes them is bottleneckers. His work has appeared in scholarly academic journals and magazines, and the results of his research have been quoted in newspapers such as the New York Times, Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. So please help me in giving him a warm welcome today. Thank you. Well, thanks, and thanks for coming. Uh, just a little bit more about the Institute for Justice, if, if you're not familiar with IJ. <coughs> IJ is, in fact, a nonprofit public interest law firm, and we represent individuals whose most basic rights are violated by government. So, as a law firm, we specialize in suing the government. That's all we do. And we take no government money of any kind, except one. And that is when we win against the government, and we win attorney's fees. That's the only type of government money that we will take. So we litigate in four areas. Four areas that include economic liberty, which we'll talk about today, property rights, which often is eminent domain or civil asset forfeiture. A third area is in free speech, and that often encompasses areas like campaign finance law and also commercial speech, commercial free speech for businesses who want to advertise and are prohibited from doing so. And then lastly, educational choice. If you're not familiar with IJ, you may be familiar with one of IJ's most famous cases. It's called Kilo versus New London. That was decided in 2005 by the US Supreme Court, where the, the Supreme Court gave the green light to cities to use eminent domain to take private property and give it to other people to develop for their own private purposes. Not for public use, like a courthouse or a school, but to redevelop those properties into other people's houses or other people's uh, businesses. So that was one of our most famous cases. We've also been active here in Arkansas as well. So within recent years, we represented a, a taxi cab owner in North Little Rock, Ken's Cabs. We represented Ken in a great win here. He just wanted to operate a business in Little Rock. He just wanted to operate a cab business in Little Rock, but was prohibited from doing so uh, through something called a public convenience and necessity test. So because of that, he was unable to operate in Little Rock, but we represented him and we won. And then we've also taken on a case about African hair braiding. So uh, women who wanted to just work as hair braiders were forced to earn cosmetology licenses. They weren't cosmetologists. They weren't, weren't doing the work of cosmetologists. They just were braiding hair. So we represented them in helping open up that market as well. So we have been active here in Arkansas and in other states. My role at IJ is to lead a team of researchers, social science researchers. I'm not an attorney, but we work very closely with the attorneys at IJ, my team of nine people, to produce research like this, which I'll be talking about today, License to Work, 
And the research that we use is used by attorneys in court. So I and members of my team have been experts in federal lawsuits uh, representing our clients. And uh, it's a privilege to do so because the people that we represent just want to earn the right to earn an honest living. That's all they want. They just want to work. And they're prohibited from doing so by irrational laws very often, which we talk about in our study. So let me begin by saying that um, there are times when being third place is actually pretty respectable. So if I were to win the bronze Olympic medal in the 100 meter sprint, that would be a significant achievement and actually a miracle. But if, uh, if you think of third place in something like the topic we're talking about today, occupational licensing, it's not so respectable. And Arkansas is in fact third in our ranking of occupational licensing. So the topic, occupational licensing, uh, an occupational license is, is, is in essence a government permission slip to work. If you want to work in an occupation, if you want to open a business in a particular field, an occupational license says you have to go to the government and get permission to do so. And the permission will come only if you complete certain prescribed requirements. That's the only way you will be able to earn the license. Licenses exist throughout the economy. So many people know that their doctor or their attorney has to have a license. You probably know that your cosmetologist or your barber has a license. But many people don't realize that today, occupations that heretofore never required a license now do require a license to work. So for instance, if you want to work as an auctioneer, or a locksmith, or a sign language interpreter, or a crane operator, or a florist, or a furniture upholsterer, or a funeral attendant, not a funeral director, although that requires a license too, a funeral attendant. So if you go to a funeral and somebody's standing around handing out programs, or directing you to a seat, or pouring you punch, or something like that, that now requires a license in some states. Milk samplers require a license in some, some states. So the list goes on and on now of occupations that require a license. So at one time, the number of people, the percentage of people that had to have a license to work was actually quite small. In the 1950s, for instance, only about 1 in 20 workers needed a license to work. Today, it's about 1 in 4. So licensing is now one of the biggest labor economics issues in the country. In percentage terms, it affects more people than unions and minimum wage. Those are two of the traditionally biggest labor economics issues, but in percentage terms, economic or occupational licensing is now uh, greater in its impact. So in our study, License to Work, we were particularly interested in knowing what are the burdens associated with all of these licenses. On average, how difficult is it to earn these licenses? So in our study, we actually have two primary findings. One is how severe these licensing requirements are, and number two, how disparate the licensing requirements are. So in our time together, I'm going to talk about both of those things, the severity of licensing and the disparity of licensing. And then I'll end talking about why it's important, why you should care, and then some reform options that uh, uh, ought to be considered here in Arkansas and elsewhere. So to do the study, we gathered the licensing requirements of 102 low to moderate income occupations in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. And we were interested in low and moderate income occupations because this is where a lot of entrepreneurship happens. A lot of dynamism in, the, dynamism in the economy is in lower to moderate income occupations. And this is where people will enter or re-enter the economy. People who are new to the United States. This is where they're going to start, low to moderate income occupations. So we were particularly interested in that because these are the type of people that we represent, number one. But then number two, it's important to understand what is the effect of government on this particular sector of the economy. So the requirements that we gathered in our study included education and experience, fees paid to the state, number of, of exams that one has to complete, minimum age levels, and minimum grade levels. And with these, we used a little social science secret sauce, and we combined them into uh, different metrics that enable us to rate and rank all of the states and all of the occupations based on their burdens. So we can figure out what occupation is most burdensome, which is least, what state is most burdensome, which state is least burdensome, and so forth. 
So with that, we were able to figure out, for instance, where does Arkansas, how does Arkansas compare to all of the other states? And which occupation is the most burdensome to enter? So I'm going to start with the latter. It's the severity of licensing laws. So when we looked at which occupation of the 102 that we studied is the most difficult to enter, number one was interior designers. If you want to work as an interior designer in the states that license it, you have to complete six years of education and experience. You have to complete a costly national examination, and you have to pay almost $1,500 in fees to the state. In Arkansas specifically, the most difficult occupation to enter in our sample was fire alarm installer. If you, if you want to work as a fire alarm installer here in your state, you're going to have to complete five years of experience before you can get the license. You'll pay almost $1,500 in fees to the state, and you have to complete not one, not two, but four examinations to work as a fire alarm installer here in Arkansas. Across the country, on average, what we found is that across all the occupations and across all the states, it takes, on average, about a year of education and experience to earn a license. You have to complete at least one examination and pay about $267 in fees. Now, to most of us in that room, in this room, it probably does not sound like much. A year of education and experience? If you're a student, an undergraduate student, it doesn't sound like much to you because you're, you're going to, you know you're going to do four or five years to complete your degree. But for somebody who's entering the economy for the first time, somebody who is an immigrant, somebody who's going into a low or moderate income occupation, a year spent outside of the workforce, just earning a license rather than earning a living is a significant burden. So turning to state rankings, we were interested in knowing what states were most and least burdensome. So on the state rankings, we discovered that um, Arkansas actually comes in number three, hence the title of the presentation, in terms of its burdens and uh, the number of occupations that it licenses. So, in terms of number of occupations, remember we had a sample of 102. Arkansas licenses 72 of the 102. Across the nation, the state that licenses the most, there were two of them, licensed 77. On average, across all the states, it's 54. So Arkansas is actually quite a, quite a bit above the national average and just below the states at the top. In terms of burden, we were interested in knowing how difficult is it to enter the occupations here in Arkansas. And we discovered that on average, across all the 72 that are licensed, it takes about two years of education and experience to earn a license in these occupations here in Arkansas. You'll pay about $250 in fees to the state and you'll complete at least one examination. So that's the severity of licensing. But we also looked at the disparities in licensing laws. And disparities mean differences um, in licensing requirements between states. There were three different types of disparities that we found in our study. The first is the number of states that will license any given occupation. It often varies greatly. Second is the requirements to do any given job are often different, significantly different between states. And then lastly is when we compare one occupation to another in terms of its requirements vis-a-vis -vis the safety risks associated with those jobs. So let me take each of those in turn. In terms of number of occupations licensed, we found that very often <coughs> there are are occupations where at least one state and often many states do not license occupations. So, let's take interior designers. It's the most burdensome one, but only three states in the District of Columbia actually license interior designers. For tree trimmers, believe it or not, you have to have a license to be a tree trimmer, but it's only true in seven states. For furniture upholsters, ten states license that. Auctioneers, are licensed in 30 states, including here in Arkansas. So the point of this is, if there's really a dangerous epidemic of furniture upholstery, we would expect that more than 10 states would license the occupation. Put differently, if 40 states in the District of Columbia do not have a license for furniture upholstery, 
it's very unlikely that the 10 states that have a license really need a license. And that's the point of disparities. Because licensing proponents will tell you, well, we have to have these licenses because they protect public health and safety. If we didn't have a license for furniture upholstery, just think of the terrible things that would happen. This is what licensing proponents will say. But these disparities that I'm talking about actually show that these arguments have little merit. <coughs> so the second type of disparity, that is the requirements to do a job vary greatly from one state to another to do the exact same job. So auctioneers, I mentioned auctioneers earlier. If you want to work as an auctioneer, four states that license it, remember 30 states license it, four of those say that you have to have a year or more of education and experience. But in Vermont, you only have to have nine days. In Louisiana, it's seven. Eleven states that regulate auctioneers have no education or experience requirements at all. So again, the point is, if, if there's really a problem such that auctioneers need licensing and they need so much experience in education, why do only four states have severe education and experience requirements? Again, it's very unlikely that all of these requirements in those states are actually needed in order to work. Here in Arkansas, if you want to work as a title examiner, that is licensed here in Arkansas but it's licensed in only six other states. So if you want to work as a title examiner, you have to complete a year of experience to get a license. That's three times greater than any other state that licenses title examiners. For me, and for many others, that just simply means that, those, that experience requirement is just not necessary. The third type of disparity is when we compare, again, licensed occupations, when we compare them against each other vis-a-vis -vis safety risks we see disparities. So the, the example that we love to, to use and Representative Williams uses as well, and that is it should not take 12 times the amount of education and experience to work as a cosmetologist as it does to work as an emergency medical technician. But that's the case in many states. In Arkansas, it's even worse. It's 14 and a half times more education and experience to work as a cosmetologist here in Arkansas than to work as an EMT, somebody who literally holds your life in their hands. They will only go to school for about a month, or the person who cuts your hair will have to go to school for about a year. 77 occupation, or 73 occupations in our sample have greater licensing requirements than EMTs across the nation. Here in Arkansas, 55 of those 72 have greater license requirements than EMT. The point of all this is that these licensing requirements are often very out of proportion with safety risks associated with these particular jobs. And they're simply not needed. So comparisons like these illustrate how the difficulty of jumping licensing hurdles often has little to do with the safety risk of a job, but instead they keep people out so that those who are in the industry can enjoy an economic benefit as a result. And that really is why this is so important. Because licensing creates a condition, a system, if you will, where people are excluded very often unnecessarily. And that those who are already in the industry can artificially inflate prices and wages as a result. And those prices and wages are passed on to you and to me in the form of higher prices. But licensing often comes with other costs, like fewer job opportunities, or restricted uh, interstate mobility and migration, which is linked to economic mobility. The ability to move is correlated with the ability to ascend the economic ladder, but licensing restricts the ability to do so. But this is not just economics. It's also about creating a just society. A just society, society that is built in part on the right to earn an honest living free from unnecessary government intervention. From our founding, economic liberty, the right to earn an honest living, was considered one of the most important rights. It is the means by which you can provide for yourself and for your family and live an independent life, not subject to a monarch or a government. That's the importance of economic liberty. But licensing impinges upon that unnecessarily. 
very often. And it does so not because consumers go to the legislature and ask for protection from the scourge of unlicensed interior <coughs> designers. What happens is members of the industry go to the legislature and they ask for a license. Please, license us. Impose your will upon us. They want the license because it erects a fence around their occupation and enables them to keep competitors out. If you were to ask Representative Williams, what he will tell you is that industry after industry after industry goes to the legislature and asks for a license of their own industry. And once the license is created, a board is established to oversee the license. And the board is captured. That is, the seats on the board are populated by members of the industry. Now, the members of the industry have the power of the government, the power of the state, to say who can come in and who cannot in our industry. And that is a significant power. <coughs> So, when I say a just society, what I mean to say is this. There's nothing just about the government telling you, you may not work in the occupation of your choice just because it introduces too much competition for someone else who is more politically sad. Fortunately, there is a way out. Reform options are currently uh, underway. There's momentum toward reform, and that's good news. There are some policy problems whose origins are historically unknown. They're lost to the fog of history. There are other policy problems that are so socially and historically complex that we cannot figure out how to untangle the Gordian knot. Licensing is not one of those. We know the origins of licensing. I just told you what the origins of licensing are. And because this is a problem of our own making, we can fix it. So here are some things that are happening. The there are national organizations like the National Conference of State Legislatures, the National Governors Association, the Council of State Governments. These organizations have mounted a, an initiative to reform occupational licensing at the state level. There are prominent think tanks on both sides of the aisle, Brookings, Heritage, Cato, and others that recommend reform of occupational licensing. There are state commissions, like California's Little Hoover Commission, that have examined licensing and are recommending reform. Even the Obama White House produced a report in 2015 that examined occupational licensing and actually recommended reform of occupational licensing. So there is reform underway, which is a good thing. And in our report, we actually have an entire section that talks about specific reform ideas. I'll mention just a few of these just very briefly. One, you'll not be surprised to hear me say that there are occupations for which there is no evidence of a significant threat to public health and safety such that a license is necessary. Those licenses can be eliminated now. Here's just one example. Music therapists. Music therapists are now regulated in more than a half dozen states. There is no significant threat to public health and safety from unlicensed music therapy. But if you want to work as a music therapist in Georgia, you have to complete a bachelor's degree or higher for an approved music therapy program. And the program has to be approved by the American Music Therapy Association, the same people who lobby for the bill. 1,200 hours of clinical internship. You have to pay uh, $325 to take a national examination. Fees to the state, 18 years of age or older, and they pass a criminal background check. All to be a music therapist. Things like that can be eliminated today. Another reform idea is to convert existing licenses into something less than a license. So for a long time, we've lived in the binary world of licensing and no licensing. But there are many options in between that can achieve some of the same benefits of licensing that don't require a full license. Like, and these are just involve the government. There are many that are market-based that don't involve the government at all. Vol purely voluntary, like voluntary certification. But things like mandatory bonding and insurance, registration, inspections, government certification, these are all forms of government interventions that are not licenses, but can achieve some of the same benefits of licenses. So that's the second one. And the third one is to severely reduce requirements. There's no reason a cosmetologist needs to go to school for more than a year 
to earn a license to work. So those requirements could be dialed back, if not eliminated entirely. We have some other ones that I will not get into in detail if you're dying to hear more about them. During the Q&A, I will be happy to go into them in more detail. But given the, uh, the ranking of Arkansas uh, in our report, third place, uh, reform is most definitely needed here in Arkansas to expand economic liberty on behalf of citizens. So in our remaining time, we have 20 more minutes? 20 minutes. Let's open it up for questions or discussion. So it depends on the state, it depends on the particular requirements, but most of the time we're talking about $10,000 or less to earn the EMT license, and often less. Sure, but they don't, yes, but if they're in a salon, they don't take away the entire $12. So very often the work is an independent contractor. So cosmetologists and barbers very often aren't W-2 employees. Instead, they work as independent contractors, and they're renting the, the stall space. So they're having to pay some rental to be in that space, and then as a W-2 employee, what they are, as a non-W-2 employee, what they end up paying in taxation and so forth is often greater than a W-2 employee. So the take-home pay for that $12 haircut is actually pretty small. Wyoming. So Wyoming was bottom of the list in all of our rankings. They licensed only uh, 106 of the 102 occupations, and the severity of the burdens for uh, licenses in Wyoming are much less than most other states. Number one was, not surprisingly, California. <laughs> uh, did you pay her? Well, I mean, not specifically for that, but, you know. Then presumably, no. <laughs> However, you raise an interesting point. So there are places and occupations where even doing something for no pay is a violation of the licensing law. So that can happen. So we presume it's not going to happen to your wife. But there are times when if somebody does, in fact, volunteer their services, even though they are not being paid, even though this is not a commercial transaction, they still violate a licensing law. And actions can be brought against them, legal actions can be brought against them as a result. So using hair as an example, I'm trying to remember, I think it was in California, uh, where an individual, this made, uh, I want to say, it was, it was one of the national papers, but an individual was volunteering to cut hair in homeless shelters. and. In that particular case, he violated the, uh, the licensing law for barbers, even though he wasn't paid. Yes, so typically licenses are created through the legislative process. So the members of the industry will go to the legislature, they will ask for a license, the license is created, a board is created, and then after that, the license is overseen by the board, largely independent of any oversight. So this is what came up in a famous court decision just very recently, uh, in the North Carolina Dental decision, where in North Carolina, the dental board said that people who have businesses, uh, teeth whitening businesses, are doing the practice of dentistry. And so therefore, they either had to go and become a licensed dentist to do teeth whitening, or they had to shut down. So the dental boards or other boards Will ex they, will, uh, they will have significant oversight over the occupation in occupations that operate at the fringe, and they will exercise that to reduce competition or limit competition. So, for people who are not familiar with the teeth whitening industry, I think we all know that we can go to the grocery store or some retail store and we can buy teeth whitening material. Take it home, put the tray in your mouth, or the white strips or whatever it happens to be. People who have teeth whitening businesses use the exact same products. The only difference is when you go to a professional teeth whitener, they're giving you a place to sit. Or maybe they'll shine a light in your mouth and giving you instructions that you can read on the box. They're giving you instructions on how to use the product. They're not doing anything that's particularly specialized and they're not doing anything that you can't do yourself with an over-the-counter product. But the North Carolina Dental Board said, no way, that's dentistry. So you can't do that. So the FTC sued them and won. 
So this issue of oversight is a problem. Very often these boards will operate with almost no oversight. And that creates a, the potential for a monopoly in essence. And that was the Supreme Court's uh, part of their holding. Any questions for Representative Williams to learn about what has been done or what might be done in Arkansas or anything else? Feel free to ask, ask him too. Yep. Absolutely. And I, I just want to add one thing real quick. Please do. We talked about, it was a little bit of discussion about this, is we talk about the need to reduce occupational licensing and regulations in the state markets. But I can tell you, and I know that um, I feel comfortable that Dr. Harper would be out and back at it, going through that process is difficult at a, at, that's, a that's not even close to the way to describe it. Because what happens is when you start talking about reducing any sort of requirements or like that, you start to go to battle against that industry. And they will suddenly show up on the capital steps in massive numbers. Because they are, I mean, it really is about protecting their industry. If you want to be in a particular industry and they don't want you in their industry, then they will put up all sorts of obstacles through these boards to prevent you from being in there, uh, in that entry. And, it's, and, and like I said, uh, if, if you've never had the opportunity to beat out the Capitol and there's a contentious issue going on, uh, take some time. You're not very far from the Capitol here, so you can drive down there pretty But there's a contentious issue going on, uh, and I'll give you, for instance, our last legislative session was within, was selling of large batch wine. And that, that was restricted to only being able to do in liquor stores. Well, we decided, so America, if you have a store, you want to be able to sell a certain kind of wine, you have the right to be able to do that. As long as you're following all the licenses, you should be able to do that. Well, when we decided, when that was coming to the floor for a vote, when we, as we were walking into the Capitol, they were lined up, several people thick on there, everybody who had an interest in preventing those folks from being able to get into their business. So it is a massive battle when, uh, legislatively when you start talking about something like that. Yeah, my favorite example comes from Florida. And this was in the book, this is what we talked. What you described is what we described in our book, only in very different occupations. So in Florida in 2011, the legislature considered whether to repeal the licensing law for interior designers. And I already told you how severe it is to get a license as an interior designer. So they considered whether to repeal the licensing law for interior designers. Also, they were considering whether to repeal licensing for yacht brokers and ballroom dance instructors. Both of those are licensed in Florida as well. So the interior design uh, cartel turned out in mass. Interior designers from all over the country flew to Florida, to Tallahassee, to battle on behalf of the interior design license. It went on for weeks. It was the issue that went to the final gavel of the session. This is how contentious it was. And they turned out and they were giving testimony and one of the individuals, licensed interior designer said, if the state repeals this licensing law, it will result in the deaths of 88,000 people <laughs> per year. <laughs> this, is, this is the type of battle that legislators will see when licenses are challenged in the legislature. This, this is classic uh, public choice theory. Right? It's the power of the concentrated interest over the power of the diffused interest. It doesn't have to be that large. The, this group, they come together. Like, so the music therapy, I mentioned music therapy. The Music Therapy Association sent, rep sent representatives to the Minnesota legislature to lobby for a license. The, the music therapy industry is not that big. But when they were lobbying for their license, Three of them testified, and then they filled the room with other members of the industry. So, so that it appeared to those who were on the committee like, oh wow, there's a critical mass of people who really want this license. Here they all are in our room. That's the power of the concentrated interest. The power of the diffused interest is all of us, and we're not there. We're not in the room when the decision's being made. So the power of the concentrated interest gets the attention, and they are able to sway the opinions as a result. So it actually doesn't take that many. Well, no, it ain't to be very accurate on that. You know, you get a room full of people, which, but you don't. Know, what we as legislators start to learn is that you you hear a voice. You know, you hear there's a, there's a meeting room and there's 50 seats out there, and 50 people out there fill every one of those seats up, opposing this reduction in this occupational license. 
But what you got to think of as a legislator is that there's 3 million people in the state of Arkansas, and they managed to find 50 to fill this room. Well, what that means is that the other 2.9999950 really could care less about it. And if you wanted to reduce that license, fine with them. It's not important. But visually, there they are. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and trust me, their their threats go crazy out there. You know, I'll make sure you're never in office ever again. You won't be dog catcher in your house in your town again. Uh, and it's and it's amazing. And some some of them pull a tremendous amount of power uh, because a lot of times those associations will work together to ensure their life their occupational license stays <coughs> in place. They, oh, if you're, if yeah. you're going to attack if you're going to attack interior designers, then yeah, who's next? Yeah, we were in Minnesota. <coughs> The state legislature in Minnesota was considered repealing a licensing law for a very small occupation. So a few of us from IJ and then an economist from the University of Minnesota, we went to testify on behalf of getting rid of this licensing requirement. We are at one table, a few of us. The people to testify on behalf of the license, were it was not just the people from that industry, but from all these other industries that were completely unaffected. Their line to speak was out of the room and down the hall. And they all wanted to testify on behalf of this license that had nothing to do with them. And it was for that very reason. Well, if this one goes, then we may be next. So we're all gonna turn out and uh, defend this license. In uh, the majority of the instances, it's a lack of, of clear information about that particular thing, you know what? You know, you always talk about public safety and public welfare, and everything like that within the thing. It's difficult for a legislator who's uh, addressing 2,000 bills during a three-month session that we have in here that see that hears testimony on 800 bills and who votes on near almost all those 800 bills. They've only got a very limited amount of time to hear the information, and everybody who's testifying in front of them has some sort of motivate motive being there. Trying to protect their industry, trying you know the one person who brought it up to try to reduce it. Uh, it it's it's more I think a lack of clarity of the of the issues that are involved. But having said that, in certain industries and in certain organizations and stuff like that, there's no question that it's about them getting back into office again. Uh, a legislator who will say that uh, that uh, they aren't impacted by that isn't being completely honest with you. Some are less impacted by that, but every time you dig a vote. You're, you're, you have to think about many things, and one of the things that, that will occur in that instance is, is not so much about campaign contributions, but it's, am I going to upset the school superintendents? You know, but I don't want to upset the school superintendents and, because they have so many employees. Uh, so it, it, sometimes it is, about, it is about that. But I would say for most of the legislators, it's more about a clarity of understanding of the actual impact of making that change. I was visiting on that topic. I was visiting with a state, a very influential state senator in Lansing, in Michigan, um, earlier this year, and I was talking about my book that had come out in December and these very, these very issues, and and he said, "I know what's going on. I see it. The industry, they come in, they ask for the license. I get it. I recognize the dynamic. But what do I say? I don't know what to say." That was so. He was saying to me, "What what do I say to them?" And I said, "How about if you say no?" And he said, well, I need more than that. So we ended up talking about what he could say, but that's very much the case. It's like, I don't know what to say to them. And when my colleagues, I don't know if, this had, if you've had this experience, he said, but when my colleagues say, oh, that's okay, the industry wants it. What do I say to that? Well, it must be okay then. Right? Uh, uh, have you heard that? Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we hear about that all the time. For me, what I always say is that uh, you know, our country is based, based upon the ability of the individual to be able to do to... Uh, you know, support their family, provide anything that is within our laws. You know, if, if somebody wants to sell alcohol and it's legal to sell alcohol in the area where they're at and they're willing to follow all of the laws, regulations, and business license and do all those things, then I think they ought to have the right to be able to do that. And we have to put minimum, very minimum, uh, hurdles in their way of being able to do that. Just something as simple as allowing us to be able to ensure that they are following those laws, you know, doing on-the-spot inspections, things like that. But uh, I think the, the most important point, at least for me, out of this discussion is the understanding that many of the, much of these occupational licensing issues are driven by the industry themselves. 
is very true, that they put, they want these obstacles to decrease competition. Well, in the United States, we want the ability of, people, of a free people to be able to freely do business that is, you know, is legal to be able to do within that state. And uh, fortunately, uh, there's a lot of people out there that uh, are um, benefit financially from creating these obstacles. And that's why you see here in Arkansas, and I'm gonna talk very, just very quickly. I asked for a report not long ago to say, I said, I wanna see a list of all of the occupational licensing, all the things that we occupy, per, that we license, permit, whatever here in the state of Arkansas. Uh, I asked that of the Bureau of Legislative Research, which is the group that does work for us. Uh, they asked, how long could they have to do this? I thought that'd be something they'd just be able to print out a report and hand to me. And I said, how long, they asked how long, they asked for a month to be able to put this list together. They did put that list together. It did take them almost exactly a month and 350 occupations that they regulate here in the state of Arkansas where that list was given to me and all of the requirements that are of that, of that list. And to me, each one of those is, goes against the very fabric of what we are as a country. Every one of those occupational licenses do that uh, because I believe that either industry can self-regulate itself uh, the government has very little role unless it really truly is a public safety and health uh, issue. And in the vast, vast majority of the cases, that's not the situation. Other questions? Yes, very often, this is what I mentioned before, where licensing will restrict interstate mobility and migration. So if you work in a state with no license, you've been doing a job for let's say a decade and there's no license required in your state. If for whatever reason you either need or want to move to a state that has a license, now you have to do all those licensing requirements. Or you work in a state with a license but the requirements are less than another state to which you want to move, the same thing will not happen. You will have to go through some sort of requirements. Even though you are working under a license and have been licensed and working for a number of years, you're still gonna to have to go through certain requirements to earn the license in that new state. So mobility is severely uh, uh, challenged or hurt by licensing and the, the discrepancies in licensing that I was talking about before. Now it's a real problem. And this is one of the issues that is gaining a lot more attention as well. In fact, Mrs. Obama, when she was first lady, this was one of her big issues for military spouses in particular. Military families, as we all know, move very frequently, and so military spouses are affected by licensing. Very often they go to a new state and they can't work. So that was a, a, a primary issue for her. <coughs> I think there was another answer. So we gathered just five of the requirements, the five most common across all the occupations. But this is very right. There are other occupations that we gathered but didn't put in the report. <laughs> There are miscellaneous training requirements. Somebody might have to get a CPR uh, training, for instance, or, or something like that. Good moral character, often that comes in the form of reference letters. So you'll have to present reference letters to a licensing board to show your good moral character, or a criminal background check might be required as well. And here's one that many people don't realize, but is, I think there's a growing awareness, but it's a significant problem. And that is, if you have a criminal background, if you try to go and get a license, very often you cannot get a license. So laws are written such that if you have a criminal background, you cannot get a license to work in particular fields. This is a real problem, and here's why. If you've served time, you've left incarceration, the research is very clear on this. Staying out of prison is linked to finding meaningful work. If you cannot find meaningful work, that is one of the strongest indicators that you will commit crime and recidivism is linked. And a colleague of mine at Arizona State University has found that there is a correlation between these licensing requirements and recidivism within states. So meaningful work is a big part of staying out of prison, but if you impose licensing requirements to say you can't get a license, or licensing limitations to say you can't get a license because you have a criminal background, then you are making it even harder for those people to find meaningful work. And so this is also attracting attention for people on this issue of license. And in Arkansas, and I know we're probably close to the end of our time, but in Arkansas, Arkansas has, in the South, the worst recidivation rate in the nation, or excuse me, in the, in the Southern 17 states or states. 51% of the people who leave Arkansas prisons are back 
in Arkansas prisons within three years. 51%. And we, you talk about licensing and all like that. How's this for government working against itself? We thought it would be absolutely wonderful to teach them a skill that they could use yes. to be able to come out and to work so that they wouldn't have to go back into that lifestyle that they were in, whatever that lifestyle may have been. So we said, we are going to train them while they're in prison and get them a skill set, welders, electricians, all these things like that. And then when they come out, they'll have a way to be able to support themselves, their family. They won't be coming back into our prisons, except the state of Arkansas licensed welders, electricians, and all those things. And guess what? Having committed or having to have served time in prison is a offense that will not allow you to be licensed. So we were spending a tremendous amount of money training them so that they wouldn't have to go back in it. And then when they came out, we told them, oh, we trained you in it. Yes, we can't license you in it, so you can't work in the field. We just spent thousands of dollars training you in. That's, that's, that's your government working against you right there. So. And we are out of time, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure.